So you can see where we are today uh, watching this video. You can see, uh, you can kind of locate people. Maybe, you know, you can find yourself a little bit in, in some of what he said. But you can see society today has fallen into the cracks of, of everything that he spoke about. Um, you know, the world around us is, is, is in such darkness. And we're not here to talk about the darkness. We're here to talk about the gospel, which is the good news. Amen? And, and uh, what I want to talk to you about is about fixing your focus. I really believe that um, Pastor Steve and I have a mandate from, from the, he the heavens to sort of hammer on this right now and remind us uh, about our focus. You know, Pastor Steve talked last week about what's, what, is, what matters, what, what's real. We're on the, on the subject of reality check. What, what's really real? A lot of people think some things are really real because they've convinced themselves that it's real because they've placed their minds and their thoughts on those things and there's strongholds that have developed in their life and they think it's real and it really isn't. The enemy has come in. There's a strong spirit of deception in the world that has come in to deceive people. What does John 10.10 10 say? It says the enemy comes to you guys know the scripture. He comes to steal. If he can't, if he, he comes in to steal first, and then he comes to kill, and then he comes in to wipe you out, to destroy you. And so we're going to look at the word here. How many brought your Bibles? I think it's important that we always have our Bibles with us at church, especially in First Peter five eight. And I'm going to probably read primarily from the Amplified. But First Peter five eight says, "Be sober, be vigilant." Because your adversary, how many know you have an adversary, you have an enemy, he, he is the devil, as a roaring lion, he seeks, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Notice the word says, whom he may. That doesn't mean he's going to, it just means he's going to try. It says he's walking about. This word vigilant in the Greek is the word Gregorio, and it means to be on your guard, to be watchful, or to be attentive. It primarily denotes the watchful attitude of one who is on the lookout to make certain no enemy or aggressor can successfully gain entry into his life or his place of residence. This person will never let up in his pledge to be watchful, wide awake, and on the lookout to make sure some sinister force doesn't successfully sneak up to attack or overtake him. I visualize myself, you know, our, our, our men at war, and I'm imagining they're equipped with you know, guns and the equipment that they have, you know, boots and all the different things. I don't think they're probably casually walking through the streets just, you know, swinging their guns around and, sh you know, woo -doo -doo, singing case sera, sera whatever will be, will be. No, they're, they're vigilantly watching for their enemy, aren't they? Because they know he's there to take him out the moment he gets a chance. And so the word tells us that we have an enemy, and he does try to seek whom he can devour, whom he may. But we sometimes live life like, da -da 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 -da, you know, and we don't think about what is going on in the spiritual sense. We're very caught up. Everybody knows we're a three-part being, right? Everybody's been taught here. We're, we're spirit. We are a spirit man. We live in a body. This is our tent. Or our, our, it's like our sheath, a knife in the sheath, as the Bible refers to. Um, and we have a soul. That's our mind, our will, and our emotions. Three-part being. But who you really are when you die and go to heaven, you know your body stays back, your emotions fail, but your spirit man goes on. That's, and if my spirit were to leave my body right now, I'd just be a piece of skin on the ground, just clump. And so my spirit man is alive unto God. Amen? And so, so... Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11.3. I want to just kind of uh, just hammer on the, the point that we do have an enemy. And, and there's something that he's seeking after in our minds to get to. And 2 Corinthians 11.3, it says, But I fear, lest somehow, somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve, how? By his craftiness. He deceived Eve by his craftiness. Not that Eve, she got a whole lot of blame. You know, and a lot of people are mean to Eve, you know, but sh she was deceived by an enemy who is crafty. So your minds may be corrupted from what? The simplicity that is in Christ. So how was Eve's mind corrupted from the simplicity that was who in God? 
She was, it was just her. She was hanging out in the beautiful garden. It was her and Adam. They had everything great. They were walking and talking with God. And all of a sudden, God said, don't go eat of the fruit, right? We know the story. And what did she do? She went over, and she was tempted. And she gave place to the enemy. What does the word say? Give no place to the devil. Well, how does she give place to him? She started listening to the wrong voice. She started talking about the problem. She started doubting what God said. Let me tell you something. The word says that we can have what we say in Mark 11, 23 and 24. It says in the Bible that God, Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. It says that he took everything upon his body so that we could walk in health, wealth, and wholeness, everything that we need. So when the enemy comes in and says, you're not getting it this time, you turn and say, that's not what God said. And you stand on what the word says, because the word says, I can have all things. I can do all things through Christ. I can have what the word says. What are the promises of God concerning this area that you're standing in? You, you turn back to the devil and you say, this is what the word of God says. I believe what the word of God says. If Eve would have said, you know what? Stop right there in your tracks. I believe what God said is true. He's not a man that he should lie, and I'm not turning my back on what God said. What's God said to you lately? What's, what has he promised you? What's deep within your heart? What's in your soul that he has said? What's some things that you have pushed back and you've given up on? What are some dreams and hopes that you've been, you've been saying, God, I just, I, you know, time's just gone on, and I just don't know if I'll ever, ever see it. I'll, I just have let it go. You know, sometimes when there's a dream inside of you, it's easier to let it go because it hurts less. But I want to encourage you tonight, don't let go. Because God has put those dreams, he's birthed a seed within you for a reason. And there's an incubation process. There's a time frame for you to carry that thing. And you, don't, you have to nurture it and you have to allow it to grow before it can be birthed. Don't abort the plan of God in your life prematurely. Amen. Okay, so that was all not in my notes, but 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, and I'm just giving you a snippet of it, it says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, so it's possible, for we are not unaware of his schemes. We are not, the word says, we are not unaware of his schemes. The reason why we're not unaware is because he's the same dumb devil. He does the same dumb tricks. He doesn't have anything new in his bag. He pulls out the same stuff. But we have the greater one on the inside of us, and we know how to conquer the enemy. Amen? We use the word. We use the blood. We use the name. We have the tools to overcome. Okay. So moving on to James 1, 5. Hebrews, James. 1, 5 through 8, it says, If any of you is deficient or lacking wisdom, let him ask of a giving God. I like how it says right before God, it says, a giving God. Let him ask of a giving God who gives to just a few people, no, everyone. How, how much? A little bit? Chintzy? liberally he gives liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching it means he doesn't hold anything against you or fault finding he's not looking at what you've done wrong or what your past is he's looking at their future he's got a hope and a, and he's got a great future for you and it will be given him that's a great scripture right there to stand on that's a promise it says he will it will be given to me only it must be what in this is the big thing in faith only it must be in faith that he ask with no wavering no hesitating no doubting for the one who wavers hesitates is like a billowing surge out at the sea that is blown hither and and thither and tossed by the wind so we can be in faith, we can ask God for something, and we're standing and believing, and all of a sudden something comes and causes to our, our faith to waver, and, we, and, and the devil's right here, right by your ear. He seemingly has a loud voice in those moments, and he says, you're not getting it this time. You're not getting your healing this time. Yeah, you did it before, but this is too big. You can't do this one. You know? Or you're not going to be provided for this time. This is way beyond. You messed up. 
you did something wrong it's all your fault god's not going to get you out of that that's a big fat lie amen it's not by works lest any man should boast it's by faith it's by faith and our faith is not it's not in our own wisdom it's not in the wisdom of men but it's in the power of god right it's in the power of him I love it when we come in here and we worship. You can just sense such power in, in, in the presence of God. It's like when we worship and we want to stop and just allow people to come up and let's lay hands and let's, let's get what's available because there's rivers flowing. There's power that's available in this place because we've acknowledged God and we've magnified him and we've put him in our focus and, and, and we're, we're thinking about him and him alone and, and we're fixing our focus. We need to fix our focuser. Do y'all know, you guys know, I don't know much about it, but I guess laser is, is light, and they can open up somebody's belly with laser. But it's all about a focus, and I don't know all the scientific parts of it, but it's all about a, a focus of a light. There's so much focus of that light that it's just, bzzz, it can burst forth skin. It can burst forth anything, probably, I don't know. But it's amazing to me that that much focus of one thing, light. You know, when you're having a baby, they always say, get your focal point. Well, you know, I was, I think I was 21 or 22 when I had my first one, and I'm like, focal point? I got a nine-pound baby inside of me. You want me to get a focal point? That's going to help me deliver this child? You know, <laughs> posterior? <laughs> You know, and I thought, okay, I'll get my focal point. You know, and your focal point, if you guys don't know, you guys probably know, it's your happy place. You know, you get your mind set on something that helps you focus. And, you know, we went through the Lamaze classes, and they showed us, oh, you get a picture of, you know, you're a baby, or you get a picture of, th I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me, right? That's going to help me deliver this baby without pain? But, you know, it's amazing what the mind can do. And I'm not into mind control, but God created our minds to be set on something else so that our spirit man can rise up and conquer and rule and reign in the situation. And I believe that's how it happens. And so, you know, I got my focal point. I don't remember what it was now, but I got my, it was my husband's face. That's what it was. He was eating peanuts in my face, peanut breath, while I was laboring 24 hours like get out of my face but anyways yeah he he had to have his strength <laughs> i had nothing no food no water no but you know it's amazing you get that focal point and all of a sudden you you know i remember on my third child it was getting really rough and i i thought i'm i'm gonna pass out and i had them all natural and i wouldn't i wouldn't totally suggest that it, you be led by your own heart but <laughs> <laughs> now I think it's crazy. I, I was with our grandson when he was born, and she had stuff, and I thought, wow, that's the way to go. But anyways, <laughs> I, had, I had them all with midwives. and So, oh, yeah, it was beautiful. I, I don't want to take away from his experience because <laughs> he loved it. He loved it. And, our, and our, our little girl was born on Christmas Day, you know, so it was glorious right in front of the fireplace anyways so uh, my third one you know I I realized my body was kind of checking out and I, my spirit rose up and told my mom speak to me and she knew what to do she started speaking the word you can do all things through Christ the greater one lives in you you're more than a conqueror and I like using this example I know I've used it before but I like it because I thought afterwards the Lord showed me if I would have said I can't do this I probably wouldn't have. I probably would have passed out at that moment, and you know there would have been lots of problems because you know th we had some we had some humps to cross after that, and God brought us through. Praise God! But when you're going through something, you got to set your mind on something else besides what you're seeing and what you're feeling, what you're hearing. Because if you're focused on your surroundings and your circumstances and and the big baby coming out, you're you're gonna probably have a problem. Amen. I don't mean to be crude, but that's kind of, it's a good, you get the picture. Anyways. Okay. So, um, so it's important that we are focused people. I, I looked this up because I, I heard a speaker say this. He said, multitasking is a myth. He said, we pride ourselves today in being able to multitask. We can do so many things, you know, while we're driving. We're, and I'm guilty of this, you know, doing things 
talking on the phone, putting mascara on, driving with your knees, you know, just doing all kinds of things. And you think, wow, I, you know, I can do this. I'm super mom, you know. But I looked it up, and the studies show, ask a pilot if you can multitask successfully. You cannot multitask successfully if you're going to do something well. To studies show that only that only 2% are able because there's some kind of frontal lobe thing that they have that other people don't. 98% people cannot multitask successfully. The reason why is the brain goes into like this, uh, I don't know, it's like a bottleneck mode and things kind of slow down because you got to process each thing. You can't possibly do too many things at once successfully. Your brain does slow down and tries to process everything. And so I want to encourage you to fix your focuser. And what we're talking about is getting your focus and your mind on things above. Colossians 3.2 says, set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. Amen. Do we take that seriously? Is that just part-time? Is that just for here when we're in service? Is that just, you know, when we're having devotions with our kids? No, it's all the time. We have to set our minds, and then we, that's why our church is called Worship Life, because it's a life of worship. Our life, everything we do is out of that place. We've set our mind on worshiping God, and our whole life, not part life, not, what is that, insurance, you can have whole life, and you can have what, term life, you've used that example, I like that. It's whole life, it's, your whole life is a worship life, and so that's how you're able to stay focused and live this life, amen, successfully. Okay, Ecclesiastes 5.1. I'm just going to read because I'm, for time's sake. It says, keep your foot or give your mind. Give your mind to what you are doing. When you go, as Jacob, to sacred Bethel, to the house of God. Isn't that interesting? Give your mind to what you are doing when you go to the house of God. For to draw near, to hear and obey, is better than to give a sacrifice of fools carelessly too ignorant to know what they are doing evil. Isn't that interesting? They are too ignorant to know that they are doing evil when they are not giving their mind to the house of God when they're here. That's some strong words. Some very strong words. So if we can't focus, we can't grow. And the, the whole thing about our, we believe God, but we're in a transformation process right now. Our, our spirit man has been renewed. You know, we, we're, we're children of God, but our mind has to be renewed yet. Our mind has to be transformed. And the transformation of the mind comes through the renewal and getting into the word of God. The word of God renews our mind. Amen. So the devil's goal is to distract you so that you do not fulfill the plan of God. Everyone here has... God has a plan and a purpose. And, his, and the devil's main goal is to distract us from what God has for us to do here on earth. And you know, I know you probably say, well, you guys are pastors, and your whole life is, you know, about the Bible, and your whole life is, you know, focused on, you know, getting in the Word and staying in the Spirit. And, but you know what? This isn't just for us. This is for all of us. Amen. This is that we're here to edify the body, but we're here to tell you what God's telling us, and He's impressed on our heart. This is this is the way to, of success. This is the road to success. This is the path for us to live above what's going on in the world. This is the path for us to not be touched by the circumstantial evidence in the world. Amen. And the spiritual atmosphere. We don't have to be touched by what's going on in the world today. We can live above it. We can live, we can live in a place where we're just moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Oh, praise God. So why waste a day focusing on what's wrong? You know, every day we have an opportunity to choose life. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day. Choose life. But if we focus each day on something that's negative, a lot of people like to think about, you know, well, all of us, we, we have opportunity, I'll say, to focus on what is wrong with us. What's wrong with our past? What we did wrong and why we are where we are now. And what we have to do to get to where we want to go. And what is our goal and what is our dream and all those things. And those things are important, but they can, do you know, they can be a distraction to your daily living. They can consume you so much that you almost get down about it, that it pulls you down and you're not living as an overcomer. You're not living as more than a conqueror because you're so focused on what you don't have that you can't enjoy what you do have. 
you know, God really dealt with our hearts in, in regard to this with our church. You know, sometimes it, it's, it's, you know, it's tempting to think, man, you know, what are we doing wrong? Why don't we have more people by now? You know, just, you, you just the obvious questions. But God says to put your hand to the plow and don't look back. We don't question. We don't look to the left or the right. We don't look inward like, like Sarah did we don't, we don't, or Abraham. We don't look at ourselves and say, how are we impotent? What are we doing wrong here? God said, you can, you will, now go and do. People ask us questions we don't know. We're just doing what God said to do. We're obeying God. We're, we're just doing what he told us to do. And so that's the way you all have to live your daily lives is to not question God. I, my point was is we have to focus on who we have, not what, who we don't have. And there are treasures in this church. Each one of you guys have gifts and callings. I was, I was moved, you know, just standing in front of Jonna and her beautiful voice. And I thought, oh, it made me cry. I was like, God, she's, she has a beautiful heart before you. I heard it in your voice. And, you know, I, I love that, and that maybe that's just the pastor heart in us, but I, when I see people, I see their gifts and their, their possibilities, and, and I'm encouraged because I want to see people run their race. We want to see people attain what God has for them, not to just go through life humdrum and, and just put, getting beat up by the devil and going from one beat-up moment to the next beat-up moment, you know? We're to be overcomers. We're to be prosperous. We're to be blessed. We're to walk in health and wholeness. Everything that God has provided for us, those are ours to have. It's just up to, take, up to us to take them. Amen? He's, he's provided everything. Jesus paid everything on that cross. He paid the price. All provision is made for us. It's up to us to access them. Hallelujah. All right, I'm getting totally off my notes here. Okay, so why waste a day focusing on what's wrong? That is wasted energy. The word says that there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen? So there's no condemnation. So when you walk out this door, I want you to walk free from condemnation. Let go of everything that's happened in your past. Say, God, he that the Son has set free is free indeed. I'm free from this point forward. I don't care what's in my past. I let go of it. I release the weight of it to you. And I thank you, Father, that you've made me a new creature in Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. Amen. The more you know who you are in Christ, the better and more successful you're going to be. Amen. Because it's not you that's functioning. It's not you that's talking. It's not you that's operating. It's not you that's touching the people. It's Christ in and through you. It's Christ's words. It's Christ's anointing. Oh, I love when, when Jesus came, he, he came and he did the works of, and, and, and the reason why he did the works, the signs and the wonders was so that people would recognize who he was. And so then he started saying, and he was a man. He didn't come. He didn't come in his deity. He came as a man and he did amazing things as a man. And then when it got time, closer to the time, he, he saw the need to start giving his disciples, imparting some, uh, delegating some, some things for them to do. When they started breaking the bread and the, and the loaves and, and, the, and the fish, there were how many? 3,000, 5,000? And, and I don't think Jesus was the only one who went around and broke the bread and, you know, no. What I have envisioned is he said, Peter, you do this. Paul, or whoever was next, you do this. James, not Paul. You, you do this. And he, and he broke. The, and, and, and so then Peter said to, there was a Sarah, and there was a Mary, and there was a John, and there was a whoever. And as they went, there was a miracle in their makings, and the crowd was a part of it because they saw the miracles and they believed. I believe that's how it happened. We don't know all the details, but I believe that Jesus wanted the people to see that they had the ability. And remember when he got ready to leave, he said, it is better for you that I go so that the Spirit can come and enable you because greater works will you do. Well, how are we going to do greater works? Well, that greater works is not necessarily in ability or in might. It is in numbers. How much more are we... Are we covering the earth right now through television and radio? It's greater works. Amen? It's not greater in miracles. We can't top what Jesus did. You know, he, ra he raised the dead. We can do that. But the greater works is in numbers. And so Jesus said, it's better that I go so the Spirit can come and enable you. You know what? Jesus was all about multiplicity. 
He's always about multiplying you. He's not about taking away from you. He's always about bringing you into blessings. When we pray for you guys, we pray blessings overtake you. When you walk through this door and you walk out, this is the house of God, but it's our house that we have dedicated to the Lord. And we say, God, every person that walks through that door is going to be blessed. Amen. And I believe you all have seen, those of you that have been here already for a while, you started to see some change. Amen. You know, when Buddy gets up here and, and leads us through that, that declaration over our tithe and offering, we're not, we're not just filling space. We're not just filling time. We're not saying, Buddy, could you give us a little offering spiel before we do? You know, no, what we're doing there is we're casting a vision before you, not for us. I mean, we're fulfilling the call of God and God's providing, but we're doing it for you because there's a principle in place. When you give, it'll be given back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men bless pour into your bosom and so what what is important is that we understand that God's all about multiplying so when he goes up he sends the Holy Spirit down all of a sudden he says you're going to do these works and he says I've given you power over the enemy uh, you know you can tread upon serpents and scorpions and nothing will hurt you amen same thing that Jesus did he said I give it to you you do it now you go and you do same thing multiplicity he just multiplied himself so it's jesus in me living on this earth making a change making a difference and it's not a puffed up jesus it's a humble myself before him casting my crowns before him i can do nothing without him jesus before you amen because in and of myself i can do nothing absolutely nothing hallelujah so focus on what's right. Wrong focus steals your energy. Okay, I only got through the first page, and it's eight. Okay, can you hang with me just a little bit? Praise God. All right, so we, it's important that we're not distracted from God by our own mistakes. I covered that. Don't talk about what the devil's doing. Talk about what God's doing. It's a temptation in this day and this hour to talk about what the devil's doing because the devil's doing a whole lot. And if you get online and listen to that, that uh, what's his name? I forgot his name already. Yeah, Paul Harvey. That Paul Harvey thing from 1965. If you listen to the actual one, it's amazing how much we are living in that day. Everything he says on there, I'm just like, wow. He pro he prophesied our future. But we don't need to talk about what the devil's doing. We need to talk about what God's doing. We need to fix our focuser. Fix our focuser. So don't focus on what's been stolen from you. All of us have had stuff stolen from us. All of us have had been done wrong. Probably everyone in here has probably been done wrong from the church, by the church. All of us probably could say we, you know, have a victim mentality if we wanted to. But that's not me. That's not who I am. I'm a victor, not a victim. Amen? God didn't give his son and, and give that great sacrifice on my behalf so that I could walk through this earth and be a victim. No, he did it so that I would be a victor, that I would be an overcomer, that I would walk in the fullness of what he's provided for me. Praise God. So you may not have a good start, but you can have a good finish. Some people probably have, you know, gone through abuse as a child and maybe teenager. You've gone through abuse and you've had parents who divorced and situations that have been lost and, you know, fathers that have left and mothers that have left and, and heartbreaking. Not, I'm not taken away from that. There's heartbreaking stories. But I just want to encourage you, don't let that determine your future. Let it charge your future. Let it be a stepping stone, not a stumbling block to your future. Step on it and move forward and say, by gosh, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm not letting that hold me back. I'm not letting a death in my family hold me back. I've had that. I'm not going to let that hold me back. Don't let your rebellious child hold you back. It's not holding me back. Don't let sin and doubt and unbelief hold you back. Have faith in God. It's simple. That scripture that we talked about in the very beginning in, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. So your mind may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Eve's mind was corrupted of the simplicity that was in, in God. 
just from one lie from the enemy. It is so vital that you are in the word of God and you know what the truth is because there is a spirit of deception out to take you out, to get you in offense, to cause you to start talking yakety yak about people around you. Maybe, I don't know, maybe about us. I don't know. But just, you know, the things that are going on in the world and your your neighbors and, and family and you want, and talking about people and that is the biggest sin that the devil has put in the church. And it'll hold you back faster than anything else. It'll cause a root of bitterness in your heart and in your life. I was reading uh, a few days ago in one of my devotions, and I didn't bring all the notes on it, but it it was talking about in the Hebrew, I think it was the Hebrew, uh, the word for, is it the gallbladder? I think it's the gallbladder, means bitter. And uh, there's actually a number translation for it. It's 83. And the Hebrew people believe that the root of bitterness is in the gallbladder. There's 83 diseases that start in the gallbladder. I don't know. You might, be, <laughs> might know more. And that's what causes people to have stomach problems because there's a bitterness in their heart. Isn't that interesting? I never knew that. I thought, wow. God has made us so intricately, we have no clue. (laughs) We have no clue. Fix your focus. Are you running a race? If you're running a race, you surely have to be focused on what's ahead of you. You you know, one time I was praying, and the Lord gave me a vision of a horse, a a racing horse, and he was racing, and he had those blinder things on his eyes, and he turned his head backwards, and he fell. Because you can't run a race going fast, picking up speed, and turning your back, looking at the back, look even on the side, because it'll cause you to stumble and fall. What's ahead of you? What's God got for you today? What, do you have, what does he have for you tomorrow? He's put you here for a purpose. He's put you in worship life to make a difference, to make a change, to bring your giftings and your callings in to equip and to assist. And let's do something in this community. Let's make a difference here where we are. Let's not waste any more time. I don't want to just exist. I don't want to just play church. I don't want to just come and have a bless me club. I want to come here and get pumped up and get, get equipped with one another and get out there and, and make a difference in society because Jesus is coming. And there's a lot of people that are dying and going to hell and they don't know about him. And it grieves my heart when I walk through the store and I see these people so downtrodden and their faces are so depressed. They don't know God. They don't know our Lord. They don't know that they could have a change in their life. Right here, smack dab in Austin. We have our own mission field. I call it a fluffy mission field Mission field, because we have all the amenities that we need. The only thing I don't like about this fluffy mission field is the heat. So I can only imagine what it's like in Africa, but I'll be okay. I'll, I'll suffer <laughs> for a little while. Praise God. Okay, let's look, um, let's look at Mark 4.19 real quick. I'm only halfway. Uh, and I won't, I'll skip through. You can be in a good church, you can be in the word, things are good, and then all of a sudden you've got two or three problems arise, and what happens? Things going good, your life's happy, all of a sudden these problems come up. Maybe it's a financial situation or uh, a kid situation or whatever, and all of a sudden your mind is focused on that. You're consumed by it. You're distracted. You're entangled by it. Your prayers are consumed. Everything about you is consumed about what's going on in this problem. And that's not God's will for us. The word says in Isaiah, I think it's 26.3, it says that, it, that we'll have perfect peace if we keep our mind stayed on him. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because why? Because he trusts in him. Amen? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Mark 4, 19. And the cares of this world, so there's going to be some, and the deceitfulness of riches, and there is deceitfulness, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now let's talk, first of all, about cares and anxieties. We're all familiar. We all have them. We're all, we all know them. They become our best friends sometimes. Anxiety, undealt with, seeds and produces worry. Worry undealt with seeds and produces fear. Fear comes in and the word says where there's fear, there's torment. Amen. How does our faith work? Faith works by hearing. 
Well, no, faith works by love. Faith comes by hearing. Faith works by love. And so if there's fa- if fear in our life, fear and faith don't come in together. They don't, you know, you know don't, one, don't, one doesn't push out the other. You either have fear or you have faith in your life. And so in order to, for your faith to develop and to grow and to, to operate and function, there has to be a place of love. And how do we get that? It's by being in the love of God. And perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love, when we have a grip on his love for us, when we have a grip on, on love for each other and, and for the lost and for people around, when we have a grip on love, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible to him who believes because love is working on our behalf. But when we're in a place of fear, we're in a stopping point. There's no growth. We're backed up against a wall. There's walls all around us. And not only can we not get out, but people can't get in to get to us. And there, it's hard to, to, to hear things. It's hard to see things that deceitfulness comes in. But God says, what does he say in First Timothy? He says that he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of sound mind. And that sound mind is sozo. It means safe thinking. He's given us safe thinking. Eve did not have safe thinking because she started thinking about something else that the devil was saying. And the moment she started thinking about what the devil said, she stopped believing what God said. Stop believing what the devil said. He's a liar and the father of lies. So everything he says, the opposite is true. So the way you defeat this fear is you get in the word of God and you find out the promises and you find out what God says about your faith and about how you believe and what he's promised in his word to be true to you. And you say, out of your mouth, how did you become a Christian? Let me ask you. You believe and therefore we speak. We believe and therefore we speak. We believe and then we confess him as our Lord, right? We confessed him. We said something. We said, Jesus, be my Lord. Be Lord over all my life. That's how we get rid of things. We speak. We've said this to you all many times, but God spoke the worlds into being. He didn't think them. He didn't didn't meditate them into being. He didn't poof them into being. He didn't have a rod. You know, like Moses, he spoke He framed the worlds with the sound of his voice. There is a sound in your voice that has creative power. The breath of God breathed into Adam and gave him life. And that same spirit raised Christ. The same spirit that breathed life into Adam is breathed into you all. And that same breath that comes out of your voice when you say something, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. There's a sound going forth. There's a power that's going forth. And it's a creative power it's a creative force and it's bringing it in it's bringing it in it's bringing it into existence you know we, we were we were dealing with Braden this past week he was had a really high fever about 103.3 very lethargic on Friday night I was I was getting a little concerned and we just kept praying and uh, you know even in my moment of weakness pastor Steve come over no we're gonna pray You know, the devil's, he's not going to get well. It's been three days. Well, I don't know. Jesus raised a man from the dead after three days, so I don't think three days is too bad with a a fever. But you know what? We get into fear. Oh, we got to run to the doctor. And I'm not, I'm not, not condoning. I'm not, what's the word I'm saying? We're not coming against doctors. We, they're there for us for a purpose. God gave them what they have to help us and equip us. But we do need to operate in wisdom and we need to do we go to prayer first do we go to god first you know when when i was young you know my parents didn't have a whole lot of money so uh, you know we believed god and we prayed and and that was our way of getting what we needed you know and my feet that used to be crooked you know were healed and my teeth were straightened by the power of god and you know lots of things happen my i remember my brother was sick one time my mom prayed he got healed. Do we look to our source first, or do we look to our doctor source first? First, do we call and you know, oh, so and so, you know, he's sick. He's sick. He's not feeling good. 
and I'm breathing the power as I say that. He's sick. He's not feeling good. No, he's not, you know, you see what I'm saying? I'm breathing. There's power of life and death in the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And so when I'm saying stuff, I'm breathing out either death or I'm breathing out life. What do you want to see in your family? What do you want to see in your kids? What do you want to see in your finances? What do you want to see in your marriage, in your husband, in your wife? What are you saying? This wasn't in my notes. I'm sorry. What are you saying about about your life? What are you saying about your circumstances? If you want to see change, change what you're saying. Fix your focuser, because if you'll fix what you're saying, it'll help you fix your focuser, I promise. That's usually the problem with people who have focus problems is they've got voice problems. They're saying the wrong thing, and so their focus is on the wrong thing, and there's a stronghold. Okay. God told Joshua to stay focused. What did he tell him? Joshua 1.8, meditate on the word. How often? Part-time, once in a while, day and night. Meditate. The word meditate means to roll over and over in your mind and mutter it under your breath. A lot of people don't do this. They think it's weird that we've gotten into meditation and all that, but this, it originated in the Bible. Now, we don't get weird about it, but, you know, just, just driving in the car, just saying, Father, I thank you that you provide all my needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. One time's not enough for me. Maybe you get it one time, but I need to meditate. I need to say it more and more. Father, I thank you that you provide all my needs. You supply everything that I need. Jesus paid the price. He took everything for me on the cross. He gave his life so that I could be provided for. I can be provided for because of the blood of Jesus, the blood that was shed for me. I can walk in wholeness and health, wealth, you said in your word that you desire that, that we all men would prosper, that we would prosper, that we would prosper. God's all about us being blessed. Amen. He's just not all about us, have the blessing, ha- having us. Amen. Our focus can't be on it. Okay. I skipped a whole bunch. Oh, we're in Mark 419. Let me go back to that. Okay. So we talked about the cares. So Seeds are being planted right now as we're, as we're talking. I'm, well, we're, we're planting seeds. The Holy Spirit is planting seeds into your heart. But there are seeds that are being planted, but the cares come in, the word says, the cares come in and cause the seed to not produce any fruit. So a lot of times people will say, I'm just not growing. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I'm just, you know, I'm depressed. I'm not this. I'm not that. Well, first of all, your focuser is wrong. Then your talker is wrong. And then you come in here and hear the word of God, and all you're thinking about and focusing on is you're not hearing, like that Ecclesiastes 5.1, you come in and you're not hearing the word, you're hearing in your brain what you've been rehearsing all week long because your focus there has been off. You see what I mean? So you're focusing on what you've been focused on all week long instead of focusing on what the anointing is here to give. And so the seeds are being planted, but the cares are pushing it out, plucking it up, pluck, 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 just like a bird, plucking it out. And the seeds are kept from growing. So we're talking about it. We lose our joy. We lose our peace. We murmur. We complain. Everything gets upset. Okay, so there's no end to the things that can get us upset in the world. But the world, the world is not going to change, so we might as well change, right? The world is going one direction, but we have an opportunity to change, don't we? So we might as well be the ones who are going to change. Praise God. Okay, uh, Joshua 1, eight. we were talking about that, meditating day and night. Your gifts are, are not enough to do what God has called you to do. You have to be God-minded and God-focused and hold fast to the word of God. Lots of gifts, lots of calling in here, but you have to be focused and you have to be meditating on the word. It is not enough to go to church. It is not enough to say, I'm a Christian. It's not enough. You have to be in the word of God. You have to be meditating on the word of God. Let's look at John 14, 27. And we see, and then I'll stop here. I have more, but I'll stop. I don't want to. How many know this verse? It's one of my favorite verses. John 14, 27. It says, peace I leave with you. Jesus is talking here. My own peace I now give or bequeath to you. Um, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And I've talked to the ladies about this before. This word, notice it says, do not let. If I let you do something, that means I'm allowing something, right? So he's talking to the people. He's saying, don't let your heart be troubled. 
So he, he's saying you have the ability to not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. So he said you don't have to let them be troubled. You don't have to let them be afraid. Stop. There it is again. Allowing. It's your will. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit, here's the permission again, yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly. There's the fear and unsettled. Stop allowing yourself. Peace is not something you have to attain or acquire. A lot of people say, I just got to get some peace. I got to get, have you heard people say that? I got to get some peace. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit, is it not? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those are the fruits of the Spirit, right? That's the song we used to do with the kids. Peace is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. If you have the Spirit within you, then you have the fruit, the ability. The tree has the ability to produce the fruit. It's within the fruit or the tree, right? You don't have to go get it. You don't see a tree going over and getting some apples. It's within its ability to produce it. Amen? So stop letting yourselves be, go back to that first one. Stop, peace I leave with you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You don't have to let your hearts, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated. Don't permit yourselves to be fearful. Because Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. You don't have to get it. It's already there. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Praise God. Okay, so we follow after peace. The word says that blessed are the peacemakers. They'll, endure, they'll inherit the earth. Um, wasting your time is a distraction from the enemy. Keep your focus on what God wants you focused on. Whatever you focus on, you become a master in. So if you are focused on your problem, you are a master problem person, solver. <laughs> Not solver, but worker, worker-outer. And that's a trap of the enemy. It's a trap to keep you diverted and focused on distractions and entanglements so that you're not focused on what God has for you. Are you guys good? Can I have five minute, m more minutes? It's 825. Is that all right? I didn't hear everybody, so <laughs> I want to do it anyways. Praise God. Okay, so um, there was one other thing I wanted to get to. So the last part of this, Mark 4.19, it says, it talks about deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. It chokes out the word and becomes unfruitful. I see in the day and the hour that we were all about, and we saw in that video, we we're all about attaining things, about materialistic things, about getting stuff. Stuff, stuff, stuff. I need more stuff. Our kids, our teenagers are all about electronics. They get one, then they got to get another. Get a tablet, and they got to have a computer. Get a computer, and they got to have, you know, an iPad or whatever the n new thing is. It's get, get, get. And the thing is, is things never resolve the sat dissatisfaction that's within us. God created us to be dissatisfied so that we would be satisfied in him. We need him to live our lives and so the satisfaction comes. That's why I love that song we do. I am only satisfied in you. In a world of empty answers, you're the only way. He's the only thing that satisfies. So the deceitfulness of riches. God wants us blessed. Money is not a problem to God. He's got the, the cattle on a thousand hills. He wants us to have money. It's not the love of money, but it's the ability and the power that comes with money. And money itself, when our focus is on the money, that's the problem. Our focus has to be on God. So, let me say this. If money, if money, if you don't have money and you don't control money, it will control you. Even, and it doesn't mean you, if, even if you have a lot or if you have a little. I know people who have very, very little and money controls them or the lack thereof because it pushes them into things that they shouldn't be doing. It causes them to, to get into more debt and, and doing things that they shouldn't do, putting you know vacations on credit cards and all kinds of things just because they want, want, want. And then there's the opposite. There's people who have lots and they're doing all kinds of things that they don't need to do and their balance is off and their focus is on entertainment and doing things because they have the ability to do it. And the distraction is there, and, and it keeps them focused on other things, planning new things all the time. And the, and, the, and, the, and the God is right in front of their face saying, hey, 
I want your focus. Full-time focus, not part-time. Full-time focus, because I got a job for you to do. I got something for you to do. But the word says here that the deceitfulness, it's deceitful. Riches have deceit that come with them. And sometimes I don't think we realize the more we have, the more we have to take care of. Every trinket I bring in the house, I have to dust. Every piece of clothing I have to bring in, I have to do more laundry. I was just saying today, I'm ready to take loads and loads of laund- uh, fl- clothes to the Goodwill. I feel like I'm doing laundry all the time. Just clothes, 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 you know? But the more you have, the more you have to take care of. And I'm not saying that God's not, not all about us being blessed. I am totally about prosperity. I'm totally about us being blessed. But there is a deceitfulness that comes in with wealth. And you know what? There's a, there's a temptation for us to hoard and to keep it for ourselves. But the whole reason why God blesses us, blesses us is so that we will give. We will be givers. It's not for us. It's for him. The first 10% is his anyways. We haven't even begun giving offerings until we get the t- first tithe 10% out. Because that's his. And all it says when we give it to him is that it says we're trusting you. We know you are the one who's responsible to get it to us. So we're trusting you, God. Praise God. God never gives us more than we can handle. So we need to pray, God, don't give me any more than I can handle when it comes to riches. Because sometimes it can come upon us and we don't realize how much it's controlling us. It's deceitful. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom, all these things will be added. Oswald Sanders says, unless we are on guard, riches become the chief end of life, and God and his kingdom are gradually relegated to a minor place. Things and money are like magnets. They can suck you up and pull you away from God. Everything you own now becomes something that can be a distraction unless God is the forefront. He is right in your face. He becomes everything that you that you're about. Money doesn't have you. Uh, let me give you a couple of quotes and then I think I'm going to close here. Okay, this is, this is about focus. Temperamentally anxious people can have a hard time staying motivated, period, because their intense focus on their worries distracts them from their goals. Reality is a pro- projection of your thoughts or the things you habitually think about. In other words, Wrong thoughts can become reality when focused on. And people can be in total deception and total unbelief and not realize what they're thinking on is total skewed vision of things because they've been thinking on the wrong thing. Their focus is on the wrong thing. But it is a reality to them. You can't get attention of one who is focused on himself. And that's another thing that the world is so focused on on itself right now. It's me, myself, and I. You know, iPad, iPhone, all the eyes are in in the room. And, you know, we're all focused on I and what I can get and where I can go and what I can do and what I can have and who I am. And, you know, God wants to, to bless us. He wants to prosper us. He wants us to be something. He wants us to be overcomers. He's given us a purpose and he has a plan. But I'm telling you what, if your focus is only on what you can do and what you can be someday and, and what you can have, and, you know, I see it in the ministry. I see people that are caught up in it in the ministry, and it, you know, it, it has them. They're all about numbers and money and, and how big, you know, the ministry is and how much fame it, there is. And, you know, you can be caught up in it in any realm of life. And there's balance. And the only way you can stay balanced is to stay in his face. Because his face is what's going to keep you directed where you need to go. And it's not a part-time face. It's not FaceTime once in a while. It's FaceTime all the time. He wants to see your face. You know, we want to see his hand move, but he wants to see our face. Praise God. All right, I'm going to close with that. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. for the leading of your spirit, for the truth of your word, for the impartations of the Holy Spirit tonight. Thank you, Father, that you don't just give us information, but you give us revelation, God. 
we don't want to just be puffed up with a bunch of words and a bunch of stuff but we want to leave here with changed hearts we want our hearts touched and molded by you god we want to be filled up to overflowing with who you are father and father right now we repent before you we ask you god if there's anything that we we've been carrying god any cares anxieties fears uh, it, the, even the deceitfulness of riches god if there's any of these areas that are touching our life at all lord we surrender all we surrender all we lay it all down we give it to you father we give it to you right now in Jesus' name. We cast the whole of our care on you, God, because you do care for us. And we thank you, God, that, that in this moment, God, we can, we can trust in you. We can put our hope in you and our confidence in you, God. We know that you love us regardless of how we've lived our life in the past. But today, Lord, we stand up, we stand strong, and we say, God, we fix our focus on you. We keep our mind and our hearts set, set on you. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to remind us of this word. Bring it back up in our hearts. Tomorrow, even, God, remind us of what's been said here, Lord. Please, God, help us to make a change in our walk and in, in what we're looking at, God. Help us to have an understanding of, of the depth of this truth, Lord. It can really make a change in our lives. And not only in our lives, God, but it'll bring change to everybody around us. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you for the Holy One living on the inside, the hope of glory. Thank you for your word that is a lamp, that it's lit our path tonight, and it's showing which way to go, which way not to go. Thank you for the anointing that is on each and every person in this house today. Thank you, Father that these men and women and children and young people are rising up and being strong in the Lord and the power of your might, that we're not caught up and intoxicated with the world's system and the world's way, but we're intoxicated with you, God. Fill our cup. Fill it to overflowing. We'll be sure to give you the glory and the praise. We honor you and we thank you tonight in Jesus' name.